Thanks so much, Anthony, for uh, organizing this. Um, and thank you, Robert, for giving me this opportunity to discuss your work with you. Um, I thought that I would start uh, by posing a question about um, the book's title. Uh, so the book is called um, Philosophy by Other Means, which in some way is the, uh, the expression that the, the book is, is striving to explicate and uh, to understand. Um, and as I understand the, one of the key claims of the book, the idea is that in saying that art is philosophy by other means, um, this isn't to say that art is in some way illustrative of philosophical claims. Um, it's not sort of a, you know, a, an especially vivid way of posing moral problems. Um, in, in basic, it's, it's, it's not supposed to be a, a, an illustration of philosophy. Um, so maybe we could get the ball rolling a little bit, if you could say a bit about what you mean by the notion that art is philosophy by other means in this distinctive sense, which you're taking up from, from Hegel. Sure. Well, uh, thanks for, for signing on to do this, uh, Jensen. I appreciate it. And thanks to Anthony for, for uh, organizing it. Um, obviously, the title is a little bit paradoxical. I mean, if it's uh, if there are other means, why why is it still philosophy? Why uh, how could you be? You know, it's, it's the old Clausewitz uh, phrase about uh, uh, war being diplomacy by other means. Um, uh, the the idea is um, by other means, other than what has traditionally been received as uh, sort of the canonical version of philosophy, which we requires uh, search for necessary and sufficient conditions of meaning or discursive analysis and justification, uh, proceeds by argument, conceptual clarification. Um, the idea is that there is a, a range of philosophical questions that are not, are not really suited to um, going all the way back to Socratic definition uh, issues or um, discursive or conceptual articulation and analysis. Um, there's a kind of illumination we need um, that we don't get by um, the traditional means uh, since Plato and Aristotle of philosophical uh, speculation. These uh, mostly have to do with so-called, going back to Shigirat's uh, thick concepts, like uh, trust or jealousy or love or um, betrayal or um, any number of concepts that um, have their grip on us only um, in the way they are used in communities in a wide variety of circumstances that are very hard to get into any kind of focus. And um, one of the things imaginative geniuses can do is help us get, a, get it into a kind of focus. Uh, most of the philosophical, philosophical discussions of the arts, especially of literature, um, tend to revolve around the question of whether there's any cognitive value in literature, whether there, is, uh, there are knowledge claims produced by, but that, that, that doesn't seem to me right. A question to, uh, to pose. Uh, there, there, literature doesn't give you lessons for life, doesn't give you moral guidance. Um, the illumination isn't um, of, that, of that sort. I mean, there's a tradition in philosophy that goes back to Socrates that what philosophy is trying to do is tell you what you already know, but that you can't say it properly. And um, in the hands of, of great artistic geniuses in literature and painting and uh, poetry, for example, um, it, it seems to me that it's possible um, to call to mind um, in ways that don't really result in doctrinal knowledge, insights, illuminations um, that we wouldn't have available to us if we restricted ourselves to what has devolved as the classic form of philosophical analysis. So, uh, I mean, there are other philosophers who, the philosophers I tend to work on, um, going back, back to Hegel, Schelling, uh, Schiller, Nietzsche, Heidegger, um, all of them give a very high place to the arts as uh, forms of philosophical illumination. Um, and I'm inspired by them and by um, uh, European writers on literature, like Bouvresse's book on Musil or Decoma's book on, on Proust or uh, Bernard Williams' Shame and Necessity or literary critics like Northrop Fry or Lionel Trilling who have, uh, or Rene Girard who have, uh, philosophical points to make um, by uh, not illuminating a philosophical claim with literature, um, but 
the various modalities that uh, the arts have available to them for bringing things to our attention that we need to know, but that and that we already know, but that we don't know how to articulate. That uh, lots of different ways of doing this, and the arts are quite very, very different, and they have other functions besides this. Uh, there's no claim that this is the chief function of um, the production of art is philosophical illumination, but it is one of them. And it, it seems to me for a range of topics, it is indispensable. Right. Thanks a lot for that, that answer. That's very clarifying. Um, one of the ideas that you develop in the introduction and then sort of pursue over the course of the book, uh, which again, I, I take it that, that the inspiration for this is essentially Hegelian, is this notion of philosophical criticism. Um, and I take it that, uh, again, the, the sort of knowledge that's embodied in works of art, it's not um, deductive, it's not explicitly conceptual, but there is some form of generality at work in works of art, which is um, historical, social, um, and it's the task of something like philosophical criticism uh, to work out those claims and to be attentive to the way that um, uh, works of art are, are minded, um, are embodying the conceptual in some way. Could you say more about what you take the task of philosophical criticism to be and how you understand this notion? Yeah, um, the, the, the criticism of approaching literature or the arts with this sort of a question is um, that the, um, the, the, the focus is so much on, for example, just take the novel, uh, the focus so much is on um, the individual characters created by the author that um, the kind of generality, as you mentioned in your question, the kind of generality um, of, of whatever sort of discursive form, even if it's not the standard form of philosophical discursivity, um, the generality at, at issue is impossible to achieve in a literary work focused on, uh, you know, Jude the Obscure or Marcel or uh, Stephen Dedalus or that there's no, but that, that seems to me not to be true. That, that there, there wouldn't be much point if we were reading these literary narratives uh, as if they were particular case histories. Um, the idea, uh, by contrast, is that uh, uh, Shakespeare, for example, could not make the problem of jealousy so compelling in Othello uh, if um, we were reading just a story about a particular individual's rather neurotic obsession with the fidelity of his wife, that Shakespeare would have to have understood something about the uh, frailty of human romantic love in general, or because of that jealousy in general. The same thing is true of jealousy in, uh, in, Proust, in Proust's novel. It, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't be a very interesting way to read the novel if it were a kind of case study, a psychological case study of uh, the insecurities of uh, two, the two male characters, Swan and Marcel, who, uh, who don't seem to be able to overcome their, their doubts about, about the other human being with whom they're in love. Um, so uh, there's a certain notion of typification as a kind of generality. Um, uh, again, in a way that doesn't lend itself to kind of platitudinous summaries or even propositional knowledge, but which nevertheless can make a point in its typification that has a very general bearing. Um, sometimes in general for the human species as such, for the life form we inhabit, and sometimes for a particular society at a particular historical time. Um, but even that can tell us a great deal about the time we live in and why it isn't the time that the particular work of art was set in. Right. And I recall that in the, the second of the two Proust chapters in the book, um, which is the, the one where you take up the notion of, of jealousy, um, the idea is that even though, I mean, Proust is a very theoretical writer in some ways, and there's overt philosophical reflection all over the place in the recherche, um, your claim is that um, to understand, uh, you know, the notion of jealousy is not to understand, a, uh, or to understand the way that jealousy is at play in the novel, is not to understand a Proustian theory of, of jealousy or to attend to these, um, you know, uh, overt moments of philosophical reflection as if, 
uh, this is where we need to turn if we want to understand what Proust, the writer, has to say about these notions. But it really is about, um, you know, tending to the specific relationships and uh, affective bonds and how this notion of jealousy unfolds in these practical historical contexts. Um, but you also say, and maybe this is part of the paradox that you're referring to at the beginning, that uh, uh, that, that the notion of jealousy is in some sense uncodifiable. I mean, it is, it is impossible at a certain level to articulate with, you know, uh, full discursive generality. So there's something that the work of art is doing um, that is conceptual, but paradoxically, it also can't be given full conceptual articulation. Is that an accurate uh, formulation yeah. of what, what's happening? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it all depends on what you mean by, by conceptual articulation and full conceptual articulation. Obviously, some sort of conceptual determinacy is involved. And I think, so for example, just take the case of Proust's um, explorations. Um, there, there are, on the one hand, um, discussions by Marcel, uh, monologues occasionally about jealousy. Um, but what's more interesting in the novel is that uh, actually, uh, it's like Proust has this very unusual take on jealousy. The, the, uh, the, the love affairs in Proust have this highly epistemological character. The characters are, are constantly beset by questions about whether they know the other person well enough or whether they are known well enough for the relationship to be in a, in a sense trusted. Um, but what, what really occupies uh, Marcel, what creates this great anxiety in him, is not so much uncertainty about the beloved's um, faithlessness or faithfulness, um, but because he has no uh, access to the persona that he is in her eyes. In effect, he's he, uh, jealous of himself. Uh, uh, he's jealous of that person that he has no access to, that her view of him. Uh, right. And so the the various anxieties he has about whether she's seeing uh, Albert, uh, whether she's seeing one of Albert, one of, whether Albertine is seeing one of her friends or not in a lesbian relationship or something like that, um, is really a figure for the uncertainty he has about what what she thinks of him. And since romantic love implies a level of trust well beyond in its claims on us, what happens in ordinary friendships or in ordinary social relations, um, this has a kind of poisonous effect on. Marcel, but anyway, I don't want to give the whole the whole theory. I'm just trying to say uh, there isn't a full conceptual articulation, like a theory of jealousy, but there's a dimension to jealousy, an anxiety about being known rather than an anxiety about knowing that Proust handles with marvelous subtlety with all kinds of inflections that, that make it impossible to present the Proustian theory of jealousy. There isn't such a thing, but there is something we come to appreciate um, after having understood um, what Marcel thinks is the basis of his jealousy and what the basis of his jealousy actually is. And I think that can be given some kind of illumination in philosophical criticism without it being like a crude paraphrase or a mere summary of the thesis of the book about jealousy or something like that. So, Right. Yeah, so I'm going to pivot slightly. This is a related question, uh, but um, it's about the second, um, uh, everything is of the, the first chapter of the book uh, on Kant and tragedy, um, which is about um, a challenge that literature, that, that tragedy in particular poses to philosophy, as you formulate it there. And part of what that chapter is trying to do, if, if I understand it, is, is to show that, um, that there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a specifically Kantian way of thinking about because um, Kant, Kant himself doesn't have a theory of tragedy, doesn't have a whole lot to say about tragedy, but you sort of work out, you know, what it would mean to think about tragedy in, uh, in, in Kantian terms. And what that ends up looking like is, um, you know, in, in tragedy, there's, there's a demand that's placed on uh, the protagonist or, or the hero. There's a moral demand that both must be fulfilled and is in some way impossible to fulfill or in doing so, it leads to the downfall of, of the, the protagonist. And this isn't just a matter of um, sort of an individual flaw. It's not, uh, you know, it's not just a, 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 an individual failing, um, but there's some necessity built into to this, this moral dilemma. 
Um, and at some point in the, the text, you formulate these two ways of sort of appreciating uh, how we might understand the grounds of um, the tragic dilemma. And the first way is, is you say that, well, from a Kantian perspective, we could say that, uh, you know, that there is, um, uh, that there is a ground, uh, that there might be a ground to know, but we can't know it because of the finitude of human knowledge, you know, we're, we're unable to grasp what that ground might be. Uh, it's, it's unintelligible to us, but that's not to say that there isn't such a ground. There is not, you know, some reason for why this happens or why this has to happen. But then you formulate a more radical claim, which is what, what you call the specifically uh, uh, tragic, uh, the more radical uh, uh, challenge that tragedy itself poses, which is that there is no ground, there is no reason. It's not just that we don't have access to it, but that there is no ground. Um, what I found interesting about this discussion is that you juxtapose sort of this, this, this Kantian and the, the Hegelian notion of, um, sort of a rational ground for understanding what happens in tragedy, because for someone like Hegel, uh, the tragic downfall or dilemma, it's, it's, it's you know, there, there are institutional reasons why this happens. There is some, you know, contradiction in a form of life uh, that points to a higher resolution. And what you say in the text is that, well, you know, tragedy, uh, it doesn't quite seem to admit of this sort of reading, you know, when we think about the blinded Oedipus or the dead Antigone, you know, it's hard to reconcile ourselves, uh, you know, to, to, these, um, uh, to these results or these consequences. Um, so I guess the question here is, uh, what exactly is the nature of that challenge to something like philosophical criticism or philosophical comprehension? And um, I mean, do you see this as a threat to uh, something like a Hegelian understanding of, of the tragic? Do you think that the Hegelian approach is potentially missing something? Uh, yes, I, I, I do actually. Um, uh, tragedy is the subject um, philosophers have had the most to say about since, since Aristotle. Um, and uh, certainly been you know, the, the, the origin of a great deal of philosophical speculation. And the issue that it raises is precisely the one you, you, you mentioned. I mean, the ultimate philosophical claim is that uh, to be is to be intelligible. Anything that is, is intelligible. We might not be, be yet able to understand it or give an explanation of it, or we, we might be in some sense um, forever unable to give an explanation. It doesn't mean it's inexplicable. Um, so I, the ultimate philosophical principle is that there, there is no, no limit to human uh, capacities for, for intelligibility uh, in principle. Uh, right. But tragedy's challenge to that is, um, it's not that there are things whose um, origination is unclear or um, whether there could have been a way out of it or something like that. The, the claim is that there are fundamentally crucial elements of human life that don't uh, allow and will never allow and, and cannot allow any kind of philosophical comprehension. And what, what I started with with Kant um, ended up being a, a kind of survey of all, almost all the major attempts by philosophers to comment on the challenge that tragedy presents. That, um, and it turns out all of them are inter interested in one way or another of domesticating tragedy. Uh, even Nietzsche um, in, in giving his account of the birth of tragedy um, gives an account of the significance of tragedy as uh, a way of justifying life. Um, that the tragic heroes are strong enough to, to endure it. And even if they fail, we, we, we come to be inspired or moved by them in a way that makes it possible to have an aesthetic justification of life. Well, there's no reason tragedy has to fulfill that function. It's a challenge to philosophy. Kant is the, the, the relevant beginning because his position is so clear. If morality is a matter of pure practical reason, there can't be any tragedy. Um, the, the reason cannot be in conf conflict with itself which is peculiar in Kant because his own picture of our human moral vocation is of a, a, an unending constant uh, battle of some sort with human self-love. Uh, and that, that doesn't get reconciled. But even Kant having faced that has to come up with the doctrine of the postulates that there will be some recompense balancing in the afterlife right. um, 
and Hegel too, as you were saying, uh, also uh, in, in noting the clash between Antigone and Creon, um, temporalizes, historicizes the tragic dilemma as temporary. Um, Nietzsche, as I was saying, is, is the same. So there, the idea would be there, it isn't just a challenge to one philosopher or another, but that there, there's something groundless and unintelligible about the human fate that philosophy is not going to be able to comprehend. And the task is not, um, is not in a way to try harder to comprehend it, but to try to understand a form of life in which we, in which we manage to endure, um, bear up, uh, under under this kind of now, as you know from that chapter, I'm, I'm particularly fond of Karl Reinhardt's um, analysis of of Oedipus. That, that the tragedy of Oedipus is not this question about responsibility, but that when Oedipus comes to learn that he isn't who he thought he was, there's no um, reconciliation with that. That there's there's no way that Oedipus could say, well, I didn't mean to kill my father, or I didn't mean to marry my mother, but it's not, it's not because the Greeks had a corrupt, you know, sort of innocent and uh, superficial understanding of moral responsibility. It's because there is no way for, for Oedipus to return to the life he thought he had or to build a new one. Uh, right. That's not something that can right. be solved. And that dimension of reflection on human life, um, showing us what that's like, um, is not something I think that all the philosophers that I know of who've, read, who've written about tragedy have ever been able to accept. I think that's significant too, interesting. Right. Yeah, what's interesting about that is that, uh, but I guess if, 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 if there's something, if, if the Hegelian picture is, is missing something, if, if the notion of a resolution that, um, you know, that, that, Hegel sees in the Antigone, for instance, uh, that it's pointing to a higher resolution in a, in a different social form, uh, which is to say that there's something like a principle of individual freedom that's missing from the world of the Antigone that we can refer to to explain why what happens happens. Um, but if tragedy in the way that you're, you're describing it is, uh, is fundamentally um, is presenting something that's fundamentally unintelligible about the human experience. I mean, that would seem to have much larger ramifications potentially for the Hegelian picture, uh, because mm -hmm. wouldn't that mean that, you know, for instance, that there could in principle be um, just permanently incompatible virtues or virtues that, you know, are both necessary but mutually exclude one another or something like that. I mean, that seems to be a real challenge, uh, maybe not just a philosophical criticism or comprehension, but to the very notion of institutional rationality or to uh, rational ethical life or something like that. I mean, is that an implication? Yes, it could be. It depends on what one thinks the Hegelian notion of reconciliation or for really amounts to what it's trying to do. Um, and there are ways in which you could see that if you, if you have it um, at a very high level of ambition, then the higher the level of ambition, the more things that are going to look fishy about it. But right. and on the other hand, if you if you lower the ambition and say, well, you know, Hegel's not interested in reconciling us with human life. I mean, you lower the bar so much that the whole notion of Hegel's ambition becomes banal. It doesn't become very interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, of course, the real question is what's in the text? What is he actually trying to do? Now, um, what 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 evidence is there overall? for what Hegel wants to say about modern bourgeois life and the philosophy of right in Zittigkeit, for example, in ethical life. Well, uh, you know, mostly what he has to say about it is that it's uh, boring. Um, his word for boring is prosaic. Um, and there's a kind of um, nostalgia for an era in which art could have as its main topics, not the bourgeois novel, not adultery, ambition, young innocent goes to the city and tries to make a name for himself, class mobility, um, but something wherein the fate of nations hangs on the decisions of one individual or one marriage. Um, so uh, there's a lot of unreconciled Hegelian picture uh, in the philosophy of right, the philosophy of objective spirit in general. Um, I mean, it's not trying to avoid your question, but yes, there are serious challenges 
that I think uh, at even the, the, the right moderate level of ambition as assigned to Hegel in telling us that we've reached a form of life in which a major sort of reconciliation is possible. Uh, it seems to me that's wrong. That's, that's, it, it, the bourgeois form of life didn't do that. And it, it's not just uh, a problem because it's boring. Uh, it, it's a problem uh, because of uh, massive injuries done to human self-esteem, self-standing that Hegel himself would recognize um, make its comprehension within some rational whole impossible. It doesn't mean permanently impossible, but it does mean okay. uh, that everything depends on what one thinks Hegel was trying to tell us about um, the fate of this market economy, relatively Republican, bourgeois family form of life. Right, because that was, that was, I guess, the further implication of the question is that, um, yeah, that if, if modernity is tragic, is it tragic in a way that's fundamentally unreconcilable, or is there you know, uh, is there the the possible, you know, in your view, the sort of resolution that someone like Marx is pointing to, but I, I think that you've just answered that question pretty much. Um, maybe it's worth it to sort of put some more pieces of the uh, picture of um, Hegel's aesthetics on the table as they function in the book. Um, one thing that you've been, uh, uh, sort of um, working on for, for years and that plays a big role in this book is the, um, the relationship between the work of art and human action and the way that uh, both as sort of um, uh, bodily actions embody intentions, embody human intentionality, works of art are also, um, they function as, as deeds in your account. They also embody intentions. They, they're bearers of, of concepts. Um, I thought maybe you could say something about how you understand that relationship because it's not a mere analogy in your account. It's much stronger than an analogy because works of art for you, they, they are deeds. And so they are expressions of bodily intentions. So this isn't just a metaphor that you're using to illuminate works of art. It's uh, a claim that you're making about the ontological status of, of works of art as um, expressions of intentionality. And this notion of intentionality as you develop it, as you know, it's not ex ante, it's not um, a discrete psychological uh, moment prior to what someone does, but it's somehow elaborated in and embodied in what someone is doing. Um, yeah, maybe you could uh, just spell yeah. out that relationship. Yeah, um, yeah, in 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, the, the idea, yeah, the idea basically that, uh, I mean, to make it very simple, I, this, this wonderful phrase by, by Bernard Williams, there's a difference between um, what we think we think and what we really think. And in action, in our commitments that actually um, provoke us to do something, we often find that what we're willing to do is not what we had ascribed to ourselves as, as willing to do. So there's, there's a particular form of self-knowledge uh, that's, I think it really goes back to this Reinhardt claim about, about Oedipus when we, we find out we're not who we think we are. But in, in the Hegelian picture of a kind of communal enterprise brought to a kind of self-knowledge by works of art, um, one of the things, um, that gets expressed in the work of art is something other than the community um, would like to think it thinks. Um, so there can be a moment of uh, genuine disclosure or revelation. And I think in the case of many great works of art uh, from some say uh, paintings by Caravaggio, for example, um, there are uh, elements in the development of a, a whole cultural form of life that can get expression, um, which does not correspond to what the community sense of itself would ascribe to itself, but which the grip and power of the representation um, manifests is a truth that the community would not be willing to accept were it not for for that presentation, this is true of everything from Madame Bovary and Anna Karenina to, to Joyce and Proust and high modernism as well. Right. Um, I mean, it, it's all clearly involve issues of literary form and the nature of hermeneutics. And so a lot of other questions involved in the 
the sort of interpretive enterprise that would get any of this right. But I mean, the main point I would want to make in the area of topics you've just you've just outlined um, is the, the the notion of revelation or self disclosure as a kind of psychological model is also something Hegel thinks happens um, it, when works of art were he doesn't think they are anymore but whether they, when they were indispensable in a community coming to know something about itself that it might not have been officially willing to ascribe to itself. Right, and that, that uh, brings me to this moment in um, the chapter on Freed and photography, and it's too much here to sort of put on the table all that you do with Freed and the whole framework of absorption theatricality that plays a really central role in the second part of the first half of the book. But there's this um, really great segment where um, you draw on the Aristotelian notion of form and matter and actuality and potentiality uh, as a way of thinking about the form of the work of art. And you draw this comparison between um, a living being and the work of art. And you say that, well, just to sort of the purpose of a living being is its own well-functioning or health, uh, that that's what a living being is, is trying to do. It's trying to fulfill its, its own, live up to its own form. Um, you say that, you know, works of art, their parts are, uh, they're organized uh, for the sake of um, their, their whole, uh, for the, the purpose that they're trying to accomplish. Um, on the model, very similar to what living beings are, are, are trying to do and living up to their form. Um, and in that context, you point out that, well, we can say that the purpose is, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, you're talking specifically about um, uh, Manet at that point and sort of the um, revolutionary move that he makes in the way that he renegotiates this question of absorption, theatricality, and free. But without maybe getting into all of that, um, how, how do you understand, is there a way that you could paraphrase um, this notion Again, this sort of Hegelian notion of the purpose or the purposiveness of the work of art. Like, I mean, this, this, you touched on this at the end of your last answer in some way about disclosiveness, um, but this is the million dollar question, but what is the purpose of the work of art on this account? What is it that, that a great work of art is trying to do? What does it mean for it to succeed? Um, it, it depends a great deal on I mean, I don't know if there's a very general answer that it's, it's trying to show us something we wouldn't see otherwise. You could, you could sort of say something like that, but um, the, the major part of your question does have to do with this issue that uh, can easily be misunderstood. The, the idea is that works of art have a form and using the kind of Aristotelian notion, uh, the form is really uh, best understood as the point of the work, um, what it's for. I mean, linguistic works like poems and, and, and novels um, uh, embody uh, a, con a concept of themselves. Um, I mean, we could ascribe this to the ideal author or something like that, but the work itself embodies a concept of itself, um, what it's about and what the purpose of manifesting what it's about is. Now, sometimes that's just entertainment. Sometimes it's suspense. Sometimes it's commercial, um, you know, action movies have a concept of their selves and it's meant to demonstrate what CGI can do that it couldn't do last year or two years before, something like that. It doesn't also be that, that weighty, but sometimes the, the, the form of the work embodies, as you say, in this metaphorical way, something it's trying to do, to realize, to bring to a realized end. And sometimes that has to do with, um, some sort of philosophical issue. Um, I mean, if you think of novels like, you know, intensely philosophical novels, it's clearer. I say the novels of John Kitsi, for example, or two essays on, on Kitsi in the book as well. Um, it's a little bit clearer that the, the whole point of presenting the narrative this way and the character this way is uh, to illuminate something we would prefer not to see illuminated. Um, right. Say the way we, the way we industrial uh, industrialized farming, for example, something like that. Uh, but they, it can vary from from work to work. Um, a part of the point of Proust novels to show us the end of the long 19th century, what the First World War meant to the collapse of the entire way of life that was built around the European aristocracy uh, and the nation states of the 19th century. So it, it depends on the work, but I, I do think you're right that it, it, my whole approach depends on 
um, there being something like a, a, a form of the work that isn't distinct from the work, it's a holomorphic notion, but what, what the work is trying to accomplish is embodied in the work in a way that can be brought out by sensitive philosophical criticism. Right, right. So very generally, there, there is this sort of notion of explosiveness uh, that we can understand as sort of the, the point um, to, to art or to great art in the Hegelian sense. But uh, what this actually means or how this is cashed out is always going to be path dependent, you know, historically specific uh, relative to a form of life and uh, this sort yeah. of thing, right? Um, yeah, I would think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one other question um, about the uh, the chapter um, on the absence of aesthetics in Hegel's aesthetics, uh, where um, which in some ways I think is the beating heart of the first part of the book. Um, and there, what you're trying to show is how you know that that Hegel um, sort of pivots away from the traditional concerns of aesthetics which have to do with uh, pleasure, taste, and beauty, um, and, and, and beauty in terms of sort of pleasure and taste. And we don't get an account of, say, aesthetic experience in the same way that we do in Kant or in Baumgarten or something like that. And what Hegel is really giving us is um, this notion of philosophical comprehension, um, speculation. Uh, and this is a very different notion of experience of the, the work of art. And that's sort of what we've been talking about is the way that, um, yeah, what one is, what one experiences in Hegel's account or what one is trying to comprehend in the aesthetic experience is the sort of, you know, the, the point of the work, what it is disclosing um, about a historical form of life. Uh, but I guess the question is, um, do you think that there's something that, the Kantian picture, um, even though it would have to be revised in all sorts of ways in light of what Hegel has given us and in light of what Hegel does to the concept intuition relation and how Hegel wants to understand the notion of beauty, but is there something in Kant's um, notion of aesthetic experience uh, that's maybe missing from the Hegelian account? Do we still need that sort of account of aesthetic experience that someone like Kant is giving us? Or is that just fully superseded by the kind of picture that 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 Hegel has offered? Is there still something to? I'm thinking of the work of someone like Richard Moran, who, in his essay on Proust and Kant, does a lot with this notion of, of judgment in Kant. You know, going beyond Kant in many ways, um, but it points in the direction of a way that we might rehabilitate or uh, revise the Kantian account in light of what Hegel, someone like Hegel, does. Um, but yeah, it still underscores, you know, the distinctive Kantian contribution to the aesthetic question. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually a very good question. There, there might be something missing in Hegel. The, 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 the whole enterprise of criticism shifted with Hegel from uh, the, primarily the notion of evaluation. Uh, the, the critic's taste was supposed to be refined enough through experience. You get this particularly in Hume, for example, but, but it was very widely in empiricist aesthetics and its influences beyond just empiricist aesthetics. The primary task of criticism was sensitivity to greatness in the work of art. That was a matter of the refined taste of the appreciator. Um, what, what Hegel did was shift the problem from aesthetics, the particular feeling and sensibility associated with the experience of a work to philosophy of art. Um, uh, that is to say to the, the, the question of the, the critic helping us to understand the meaning of the work. Right. Um, but Hegel's notion of the meaning of the work is so wrapped up in his own enterprise that so coming to self-consciousness about uh, human freedom that the only notion of aesthetic experience, what happens to us when we're gripped by a work of art, the only notion he has is relatively impoverished. It's this notion of belabor, which is in Kant, of enlivening, of you know, a kind of concept coming alive in a work of art. Um, and that doesn't get you very far. Um, so I think uh, attention to the particular modality of self-knowledge, the sensible modality, um, rather than discursive modality in appreciating a, a, a film or a novel or a poem um, is something Hegel is not particularly well suited to help us understand. Um, the, the work fits into the systematic purposes of the encyclopedia. Um, much too quickly for us to really understand better 
what we want to understand, what it means to be moved by a work of art and in being moved to have something be illuminated that we would not otherwise be able to see. Um, that I think is a deficiency in Hegel's notion of philosophical criticism. It doesn't reproduce in the criticism, the experience of the work. And that, that should be a touchstone for, for any critic. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I think Anthony wants us to move to Q&A, but, um, you know, I think the, the fantastic chapter on Adorno, uh, you know, the, the, the Robert undertakes this really brilliant, important critique of, of Adorno, but um, it occurs to me that, I mean, Adorno is one person who does try to think uh, this notion of aesthetic experience after Hegel, the shudder, you know, um, all of these sorts of things where Adorno is really trying to, to synthesize, you know, Kant and Hegel and to sort of um, revise the notion of aesthetic experience in light of the, the experience of the historical experience of modernism or something like that. But No, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. That's well said, I think. But um, let's see. Uh, what we need to okay so we've got a few q and a's here uh, anthony do you want to moderate this or should i or okay um all right so let's see uh the first question we have is um uh whitney shaw asks what does it mean to know something but to not be able to articulate it yet are there certain subjects that are uniquely suited to this kind of knowledge? Yes, yes, uh, tremendously interesting question. I mean, it goes back to, uh, uh, for example, Aristotle's doctrine of the phronimos, of the practically wise person um, who cannot formulate um, uh, something like, um, when is it a good time not to go to war, um, for example or uh, various questions that involve when it's reasonable to trust someone or um, whether something is an example of uh, self-deceit or self-ignorance. Um, I don't, uh, it's, it's, we, we, ha we, we can't know things that we can't teach other people. Um, I mean, philosophy is a non-empirical enterprise. It isn't based on empirical study. But there are things we learn from experience that are indispensable in philosophy. And we can learn them best when we have the experience represented in its various dimensions more clearly and more focused by an imaginative genius. And then we can learn something and still not know what it is we've learned, not know how to give expression in propositional form uh, to something we now understand better than we would have. And they have that, that range of topics like that. Uh, as I say, thick concepts or non-definable notions like jealousy or trust or betrayal um, th that have orders of significance in human life um, that don't lend themselves to a kind of ranking or are, you know, decisive articulation of the last definitional um, uh, capturing of, of, of what it is that's in the work. But as I say, the notion of non-propositional, non-teachable, but genuine knowledge goes back all the way to Aristotle. And it's sort of been, uh, ex except for contemporary Aristotelians like McDowell, it isn't, it isn't as prominent as I think it might be when we're trying to figure out uh, literary works, uh, the whole enterprise of hermeneutics. Great. Uh, so the next question, um, which I know that you've thought about this, uh, Robert's published an article on this topic. Um, Andreas asks, uh, what do abstract arts like non-representational art uh, or music contribute to philosophy? Um, well, it's sort of in redefining um, what art is, um, I mean, in a number of ways, first of all, Adorno's, um, that there is a kind of um, shock effect of uh, abstraction or of, of modernist visual art uh, that is primarily suited in, in a unique way to resistance to its uh, commodification. Uh, and the whole issue of why it needs to resist its reduction to commodification is something we can learn from uh, in various nuanced ways, from various different styles of modernist visual, modernist visual art. Um, 
uh, Adorno is particularly good on music in this respect as well, in uh, complex modernist music demanding a kind of attentiveness uh, on the part of the viewer um, that defeats the default assumptions about entertainment, soothingness, relaxation, and all of the other um, conventional ways of uh, domesticating <clears throat> the radicality of, of art. Um, it, you know, in general, it depends on which particular painting, which school of art, which school of music, but um, the, the, the need in modernism to rethink the point of art in an age of mass consumer societies and commodification um, is an infinitely rich topic, why it would need to do that. And especially, I think if Adorno were alive today, he'd probably agree why it failed, um, why it couldn't resist it. I mean, you, you, you can sell a thumb drive for several million dollars now. Um, the, 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 the creative capacity of capitalism to commodify any slight gesture that might be saleable uh, was beyond the possible imagination of Marx or Adorno or anybody in that tradition. Um, so there's another thing to think about is the failure of modernist art to um, uh, realize this resistance um, and reinvigoration of art. But as soon as art becomes something that can no longer be taken for granted, then the artwork becomes a vehicle of its own um, uh, self-expression, self its, its own self-definition. So the, the project of modernist self-definition anew um, is something that seems to me to lend itself to lots of interesting discussions. Yeah, I was just going to add that, you know, like in your piece, what was abstract art, where you show that part of what happens in um, abstract expressionism and, and in the, the sort of later modernist painting um, that uh, uh, you're sort of contrasting your position with someone like Greenberg by showing that part of what we're learning about in those works is um, you know, what it means for a painting to be a painting. And it really is about the realization of uh, the medium specificity. And um, I mean, Greenberg takes this to be sort of a, just a, a, a sort of illumination of the material conditions for something like painting. But as you show, this is also a question of, um, you know, something like uh, the medium's recognition of its own capacity for normative self-legislation or something like that, or what, uh, its own formal constraints, you know, must be or could be or something like that. So yeah. I take it that that's yeah, this another this, 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 Yeah, this is something I found quite valuable in Fried's work that in his distinguishing himself from Greenberg, that the idea of pursuing a kind of essence of art, you know, flatness is um, way too ahistorical and way too Kantian. You know, that there, there isn't, there has to be a way of thinking of art about art's development historically without a kind of radical historicization that ends you up with the position of someone like Danto, uh, where the whole art non art distinction fades away um, and there doesn't seem to be any point in even worrying about it anymore. Um, so I, I think the limitation of Greenberg's atemporal formalism um, is something we've sort of learned because of him, because of his attempt to give to art the task of self-definition, but saddling that self-definitional self project with a kind of a, a historical essentialism that it doesn't have. Right, right. So let's see what our next question is. Um, Michael Atkinson asks, uh, Robert suggests that Shakespeare can teach us something profound about say the nature of jealousy because the, the play is not merely a transcription of the relationship between Othello and Desdemona, but deals with things beyond that particular relationship. I am struggling to see why a piece of literature written as a straight biography could not achieve a similar end. Does Robert agree? And if not, why not? Well, it depends on how the biography was written. If it's a literary biography done with great style and with a, a kind of insight that only the right form can give it, it might. Um, but the, the, the point of the compression of uh, meaning that in a way frees us from sort of a clinical case history kind of approach that, that gives us something like the, the typic um, in a literary presentation, um, it, 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 it's, a vehicle for self-understanding that just a recitation of the facts, you know, Othello believed this and this and this. We have to actually experience 
the growing uncertainty of someone like Othello in the position he's in, um, the frailty of his conception of himself as worthy of being loved, um, we have to have a kind of narrative experience of that to understand it. We're not, we're not talking about a kind of observational, psychological, clinical perspective. We're, we actually have to be made to feel why it's credible for Othello to be so susceptible to Iago. Uh, and that says something about jealousy and its relationship to um, human trust and uh, self and other knowledge that I don't think can be formulated by a biographer in anything other than really banal terms. It's the literary experience of Othello and his experience that give us a kind of insight into him that we wouldn't have if we were just reading like a paraphrase of what we thought we got out of it. It doesn't work that way in, in literature or, or we are reducing everything to clinical studies of individuals. I mean, one way of responding to your question is why not just, why not just reverse it? Why, why read literature at all? Why not just read uh, you know, informed psychological biographies of people to figure out how human beings work? That'd be a tremendously impoverished way of trying to figure out how human beings are human and what, what, what's distinctive about the human experience. Uh, of, of the human because the thinness available to us in the prose that would describe in observational terms, the psychological traits would eliminate this whole notion of experiential knowledge that we get by experiencing a literary work. If it's a great literary work. I mean, many literary works are, you know, so I'm a big fan of crime thrillers. I don't, but I don't read them, you know, thinking I'm gonna get anything other than entertained. Um, but they all involve human emotions and uh, you know, betrayals and surprises and uh, unknowns and so forth. They're, they're, they have literary qualities, but they don't have the qualities of high art. Right. And I do believe in that distinction. I think maybe we have time for one last question. Um, this is from uh, Dominic Lash. Uh, Discussions of the relationship between art and philosophy often seem to have to decide where the real philosophy gets done. In my field, film studies, we get philosophy of film, where the film doesn't do any philosophy, and various versions of the claim that film thinks, and whose strongest forms the films themselves seem to do all the philosophy. In the light of what's already been said, I wondered whether this suggests that framing the problem this way is an unhelpful way of setting things up. Might you have any further reflections on this? Yeah, I think that's actually a very, very good point. I'm, I'm very much in favor of what's now called film philosophy, but not terribly in favor of that name or um, the rubric under which it is done precisely for the reasons Dominic was suggesting. Um, we, we get this binary opposition between uh, there's philosophy driving the whole thing and film, for example, as a, an illustrative handmaiden to the the, the big enterprise of, of philosophy, or we get film not attended to as film, um, but as philosophy, as, as sort of um, uh, visualized philosophical themes. So uh, we need, I think all we need are thoughtful works of art. <laughs> if the work of art is a thoughtful work of art, then attending to it properly uh, given that it is announcing itself as having the ambition of directing our attention to something more than the narrative details, but to the point and meaning of the narrative details, if we could have, you know, some, some notion of thoughtful film or thoughtful literature or literary thoughtfulness or uh, because the professional, um, th there's so much professional um, uh, boundary policing in both philosophy of art and in um, the, the disciplines under which the study of art is organized that don't seem to me all that interesting or and get in the way of a lot, a lot of other stuff. Um, any thoughtful appreciation of Shakespeare is going to be thoughtful about things other than water imagery or something like that in, in and, and more thoughtful than, um, uh, you know, uh, the theory of guilt in Macbeth or something like that. So um, it's just, there's just good and bad criticism. There isn't really, I think, uh, much to be gained 
by by excessive policing of boundaries, which is unfortunately where a lot of the, the interdisciplinary of business uh, in the modern university goes on.